coming up next on the Wet Fly Swing podcast. And it really gets into the hardcore parts of like the color spectrum, uh, lens tints, uh, different frames, how they shield your eyes. And uh, you know, most of it is like tips and tricks that I've learned from like guides in New Zealand and stuff on how to get into the best possible position to see fish and how to use your peripheral vision instead of your foveal vision. That was Ross Purnell digging into a little tip on spotting fish. This tip and many more from the head man at Fly Fisherman Magazine today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? A good way to support this podcast is by sharing it out. If you found some value and know somebody who would love to uh, grab a few tips today, go ahead, just click that share button in your app and uh, give it a go. Thanks in advance if you had a chance to do that. This episode is sponsored by Daddy Flies. Established in 1928, Daddy Flies is the oldest family-run fly shop in the country, now in their 94th year. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash daddy to find out what their secret has been for almost 100 years. That's wetflyswing.com slash D-E-T-T-E to support this podcast and the oldest fly shop in the country. We are also supported by Angler's Coffee. With a blend for every taste, a dry dropper on the go tea bag option, and a roast sampler, you know Joe at Anglers has you covered. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash anglers right now to support a sustainable company with unsurpassed taste. That's A-N-G-L-E-R-S, Anglers Coffee. Ross Purnell, the editor of Fly Fisherman Magazine, walks us through his story and how he created one of the biggest and best magazines in the fly fishing space. We find out how it all started with Jacques Cousteau impacting his trajectory, the biggest topics uh, that they've covered. We also dig into um, a little bit about where uh, he and the magazine is heading next and, and a focus on a little bit on travel. One of the fly fishing staples for many of us out there. So without further ado, here he is, Ross Purnell from flyfisherman.com. How's it going, Ross? Great. Wonderful rainy day in Pennsylvania. Glad to be talking to you. Awesome. Yeah, it's good to have you on here. We've, uh, you know, you're one of those people with your name. I've heard your name a lot over the years and I've been wanting to get you on. So I'm happy to have you on here to talk about uh, Fly Fisherman Magazine, one of the largest, uh, maybe the largest uh, mags and blogs out there in the space. So we're going to dig into all that today and give people a little rundown of what you have going. But uh, take us back really quickly to the beginning. How, how did you first get into fly fishing? Start there, then we'll go back into the magazine. Ah, oh, the very beginning. <laughs> it, it all depends on how far you really want to go back. I, I'd say the person that uh, got me in, interested in fishing was Jacques Cousteau. Oh, wow. L watching like those old black and white, uh, you know, his scuba diving adventures when I was a little kid. And I think that just got me fascinated on like what's going on underneath the water. And I think, you know, that's not a very obvious connection to fly fishing, but uh -huh. that was like my earliest fascination of like with fish and what's going on underneath the water. And he really got me intrigued in the whole underwater world. And, you know, I really think fly fishing is just, uh, you know, our way to connect with and yeah, try to understand uh, what's going on underneath the water. So to me, it's perfectly aligned. That's cool. Yeah, we had a recent guest who also, I can't remember who it was, but uh, it, it also mentioned Jock. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, and I remember him. I mean, he was huge. This guy was bigger than life, right? He was traveling the world. And uh, and what was his thing? He was just a, I can't remember now. For those that don't know, I'll, I'll try to get a video, old video of him. But what was it? It was like like he was exploring, right? Just exploring the underwater world? Yeah. I mean, he was one of the first, well, I think he was the first guy that ever put like scuba diving on, you know, in front of the masses on television oh. and he would go to different places and he had a French accent. So it sounded very exotic <laughs> and he would go out of his way to show you things like octopus and, you know, strange fish that, you know, people really had no idea what was going on down there. He was the first one to really bring television cameras underwater so you could you could experience what's going on there. And it's to me it was right up there with uh, 
people walking on the moon and it happened kind of around the same time. Oh yeah, that's right. And and now, I mean, if, to make the connection, obviously you have the fly fishing, you know, the magazine and everything, but what was, you know, when you look at, went back to Jock, keeping it there for a second, I mean, do you, I'm not sure if you remember any of that, but species wise, I mean, I know you're traveling around the world and doing some of that now. Uh, is there a connection there when you're out there, you know, uh, you know, traveling to the jungle and things like that? Or, or, or are you, I'm not sure what you're doing. Maybe start us there. Where are you fishing throughout the year? Are you kind of traveling a lot and fishing all over the world or, or kind of closer to home? Um, yeah, normally I do a lot of traveling and not, not as much fishing around home. I think the connection there is that, uh, you know, what Jacques Cousteau was doing is bringing awareness to the environment. Like he's mm. could also consider him one of the earliest environmentalist and i i for me it's a truth that people aren't going to care about things they aren't aware of that they aren't involved in you know you don't care about things you don't know about so you know jacques Cousteau brought awareness to what's going on and uh, under the sea and made people care about it so to me he's one of the first great ocean environmentalists uh, for me that's that's the great that's the great segue uh you know yep and for me in my fishing life and in the magazine, uh, it's not just about catching fish. You know, I love <laughs> the, the entire uh, environmental aspects and the cultural aspects, which is why I love to travel. I love everything around the fishing. And I think the fishing is, you know, just one reason to, you know, work to preserve all of these things. Yeah. I think there's a big question there. Bring to light some of these amazing people people and places so that people begin to care about them and in the in the long run that's going to help yeah i love that i love that i think that's the amazing thing yeah people you always look at the journey of people right like somebody right now is just getting into fly fishing and they're just learning how to you know cast or whatever but eventually yeah you stick with it long enough and you go through this this process of you know conservation comes into it and and travel i mean that's definitely huge for me you know just exploring is as much about the fish as the fishing um, for you, so, so tell me that, so this is very, you know, interesting. It sounds like I'm sure you could travel anywhere in the world. How do you go about choosing, you know, either kind of the next trip or the next article or all that? How does that work with the magazine? Well, uh, well, it's never the same way twice, but you know, a lot of it's based on, uh, invitations. You know, I get a lot of invitations mm-hmm. to go here and there and, uh, so I sort of wade through things and try to find out what is the most uh, interesting story. And it's hard to tell before you've been there or done it. You, you don't know where the most interesting story is. So, you know, we at the magazine, I deal with two kinds of stories. You know, most of the stories that run in the magazine, I'm, I'm not personally involved with. But somebody pitches me the story idea and, you know, I decide if it'll be a good fit for the magazine and they write it and I edit it. That's, you know, 99, 95% of the content in the magazine. Uh, but every once in a while, somebody will call me up and, and say, you know, you know, this is a great story. This is something that's never been done or something that people need to be aware of. And we'd like you to come out and do it. And if it fits in the schedule and I think it's a good story for the magazine and there's, no other like experts on the ground then sometimes uh you know i fit in there as sort of the the traveling journalist i i really like to depend on like local experts um you would never catch me writing a story about how to fish in pennsylvania and stuff like that because there's a lot of great writers here and people who are guides and they know everything about it. So I don't have to write those stories. I depend on the local experts to do that. And that's kind of why I end up doing a lot of international travel because a lot of those places, there isn't a local expert that, you know, can also write and, you know, produce a story. So they, they depend on outsiders to come in and, and tell their story. That makes sense. And that's how I ended up in places like Mongolia and and in the Amazon and places like that. Yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, so in case in point, uh, Trout Bitten, we had Dominic uh, Swintoski on recently. He's kind of up in your neck of the woods. And, yeah, he's got a great blog. People are loving it. He writes, you know, if you want to learn about mono rigs and everything, and especially in Pennsylvania, he's the guy. 
Um, so, so yeah, this is awesome. So you do some traveling and, um, well, we'll take us back. So you mentioned, we mentioned Jock at the start. So how did, so when did that first fly rod? So Jock into the first fly rod, take us there real quick and then we'll jump uh, along here. Yeah. So that's going way, way back. Uh, and then when I was like maybe eight or 10 or 12 years old, uh, I was just fascinated with fishing because of the Jacques Cousteau connection. Uh, but my dad wasn't much of an outdoorsman. My dad's a school teacher, uh, was never into fishing, but he would sort of reluctantly take me along, uh, set me up with, uh, some salmon eggs and a spin rod. And I just sort of clunked along and bait fished and tried to figure things out, caught, uh, you know, little brook trout in beaver ponds on with a willow stick and a string and a safety pin. And, and did all of that stuff all, all through my youth. This was in Alberta, by the way. I grew up in Calgary. Oh, nice. And then uh, as soon as I was 16 years old and got a driver's license, I almost instantly started fly fishing because I could get my parents' car, go down to the Bow River. You know, I basically grew up right, right along a, a catch-and-release blue ribbon trout stream. So... As soon as I could drive myself there, um, I got myself set up with uh, uh, a rod. Uh, my mom bought me a subscription to Fly Fisherman magazine on my sixth oh, wow. birthday. So that's kind of how I learned to fly fish is by reading Fly Fisherman magazine. So I was a big fan for, right from the start. Um, and... Uh, I started reading stories in Fly Fisherman magazine from people like Lefty Cray and Gary Borger. And then I remember making the logical connection and going and renting VHS uh, tapes by Lefty Cray and Gary Borger to sort of uh, up my game on my home water. So I, I really learned to fly fish through magazines and, and film and, and different media. I really didn't have a mentor. I dragged... Uh, I dragged a lot of my buddies along, kicking and street screaming along the way, though. That was fun. Yeah. But that's how I learned. That's really cool. Yeah. So, I mean, essentially, you have the same mag- magazine now that you're running. Um, that was it. And, I mean, what do you remember back, you know, obviously Lefty was huge. All these guys were gigantic. That what You know, what you really loved about Fly Fisherman Magazine back then when you first started reading? What, what kind of copy? Because there were, or was it the only one then? Were there, I mean, I can't even remember if there were other ones out there. Uh, no, there were several ones out there, and there was also local magazines. Um, the thing that made it special to me, honestly, is that Fly Fisherman magazine was like, you know, this big American, you know, top dog in the fly fishing world. And every once in a while, they did stories on the Bow River, which was my home river, which I thought was super awesome. And the guy that wrote those stories in Fly Fisherman magazine, he owned the local fly shop, Jim McLennan. Oh, cool. So, you know, I went, I bought my first fly rod from Jim McLennan when I was in high school and he was writing articles in Fly Fisherman magazine. And, you know, when I was in university, I I remember thinking, man, wouldn't it be cool to do like, do something like Jim McLennan and get, get an article published in Fly Fisherman magazine. That was like a dream at one time. Huh. There it is. That was a dream. And, And that dream came true. It did. Yeah. Yep. First magazine that I started with, it's, it's even weirder than that because uh, in the early 90s, I was a fly fishing guide on Bow River and I advertised in Fly Fisherman Magazine and most of my customers came from Fly Fisherman Magazine. So I went through this big uh, like circle of being like a, a reader, learning from the magazine, then I became an advertiser, advertised in the magazine, then eventually became the editor and the publisher. Exactly. Yeah. And now, and now it's full. Uh, well, I'm not sure that's full circle, but yeah, you're, you're the head, head honcho there. So kind of is, I mean, fly fisherman's been my whole life since I was about 16 years old. I know that is really cool because it is, I mean, the magazine, uh, is so big. It's all, and for me too, I mean, I have my entire life fly fisherman magazine has been there. You know what I mean? Like you've had all these magazines along the way. And of course you got great ones now, you know, you've got the Drake and, Fly fish and everybody has their their kind of their niche, right? Their little niche. But fly fisherman has always been there for me as well. I remember it since I was a little kid, and uh, and that's pretty powerful. So what I mean when you jump in there now, you're you're kind of leading the charge. Do you just jump in and and learn from those there, and then 
and kind of keep it going? Or do you really tweak things as you're going, say, you know, last whatever 20 years you've been doing this? Well, if you do like a snapshot now and 20 years ago, it looks like a vastly different magazine. But I'd say the tweaks happen little by little over time. You know, it's it's very hard to just change the whole thing at one time. Plus, things change as you as time goes along and you have different priorities and uh, different design ethics and things. You know, you have different technology, things get more modern. So. It would be a very bad thing if things stayed the same. Yeah. Uh, I think you know, magazines always got to evolve and change and represent the sport as it is now or as, more importantly, as it should be in the future, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to learn, of, learn a lot. You know, I'm constantly learning on the job as I go along and. It's not like I started the magazine and had all the answers to everything. I've learned from a lot of people along the way and have been influenced by a lot of people along the way. And so it's a group effort. Yeah. And one of those people I, I wanted to touch on was um, uh, John Randolph. And I'm not sure if he was, maybe you could talk about that transition. Um, you know, I, I can't remember exactly on the timeline, but you, you did make the transition into editor and how did that you know, to talk about John first, how he influenced you, and then go into how that transition happened. Uh, well, John hired me in 1996. I have I have kind of a funny. Uh, I got lots of funny stories about me and John Randolph, but <laughs> yeah. uh, the way it kind of started, he was interviewing me for a job in in 1996 to come and work at Fly Fisherman Magazine, and at the time I was a newspaper editor. And I was doing a phone interview with with John Randolph and someone came into the newspaper office and assaulted me while I was doing a job interview. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so John and I got off to a funny start because he used his other line to call the police and say, someone's getting assaulted. <laughs> it was pretty funny. He could hear the whole thing on the phone. So you knew, obviously you knew Fly Fisherman Magazine and then and then how did he and hit, how did he know you? How did he or how did that connection happen again? Uh, they were just looking to hire somebody who had uh, newspaper experience, like a journalist with newspaper experience, somebody who had uh, uh, experience in the fly fishing industry and knew what they were talking about when it came to fly fishing. And so I just applied, and I believe that's the first time I'd ever talked to John Randolph on the phone. Uh, but apparently he liked my uh, toughness. <laughs> Uh, got back on the phone and said, John, John, the, the newspaper business is really tough. I'd really like to go into the magazine business. And he hired me and, uh, I started in July 1st, 1996. Uh, the first four or five years we had an office, uh, in Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, and, um, so I didn't have a lot of, uh, day to day contact with him. But uh, in 2001, he uh, the company closed that satellite office, and John said, uh, "If you're willing to move to Pennsylvania, uh, you'll be the editor of the magazine someday when I retire." And that happened about nine years later, I think 2009. 2009. That's that's awesome. So basically, you you knew you were kind of getting kind of set up for that. What what yeah, was it like? He was, he was grooming me the whole time. As soon as I showed up in Pennsylvania, like the first thing we did was went down to visit Lefty Cray and spent the afternoon out at his pond taking casting lessons. And, you know, then we took a trip to Florida and spent an afternoon with Stu learning how to cast and fight fish and stuff like that. So he really took the time to introduce me to all of you know, the people in his like stable of writers and his old contacts, the people he fished with so that I could quickly learn what he had learned. So he was a hell of a mentor to me and you know, almost like a father to me, honestly. Yeah. And did you know, you know, when you first kind of got that job in 96, I mean, it must have been, I mean, how did that feel? I mean, you've been your whole life, like you knew this thing. And then did you kind of First, how did it feel? And then did you just know this was you were going to be there for, you know, kind of forever? I did. I mean, I was 
I was a Canadian living in Canada and just, you know, had this job to offer to pack up my whole family. I had three little kids, wife, three little oh, kids wow. and just moved to a foreign nation and take this job in a town. I didn't, didn't know anybody, but I said, hell yes, I'm going to do it. It's fly fisherman magazine. That's, you know, it's everything I've been dreaming about. You know, when I went to journalism school and all that, that was with the idea of just like getting an article published in Fly Fisherman magazine. So when the opportunity came to get on the staff, I, I definitely did not hesitate. And so, you know, changed my whole life, the life of my family and my kids and everything, but worth it. Yeah. And now who's the, like, I'm not even sure as far as, you, you know, the, the staff or whatever, is, is there a bunch of people, a few people? How's all that look now? Uh, there's a bunch of people. We work for a bigger company that publishes like 18, 19 magazines. So we have a lot of shared resources, like people that, you know, you know work in production and they, you know, they'll produce several different magazines. Like in our company, it's also bow hunter and bow hunting and, Oh, yeah. Florida sportsmen. So we've got a lot of people that work on on multiple magazines. But as far as just uh, the dedicated people that work just on our magazine, it's it would be uh, Ben Hoffman, our sales rep, Dennis Pastuca, who's our our art director, and uh, he's really made. He's been with us three or four years. And, you know, when people look at the magazine and say, wow, the photography and the design and the art is amazing. That's because of Dennis. And he's really made an impact the last three or four years. Um, then we have a digital editor, Josh Bergen, who uh, handles Fly Fisherman from the dot com point of view. And he lives in Belgrade, Montana. There you go. There you go. The small team. Yeah. No, it's this is cool. This is a really cool. It's it's awesome to hear that story and how you know from the beginning and throughout. And um, well, I wanted to dig in just a little bit. I was doing a little bit of you know uh, kind of research on more on the blog, and I'm not sure the connection. Maybe we could start there when you think of you know the magazine itself. So you've got all this content. Obviously, the magazine's been there, but the blog is huge now too. Uh, the website and everything. How does the content look there? So when you publish something in the magazine, is it Get, is it totally different or what's the connection there? Uh, we publish something in the magazine. You know, every article sort of has a lifespan. Uh, the, the magazine is on um, newsstands for like eight or ten weeks. And then after it comes off newsstand, uh, it appears on uh, flyfisherman.com. And Josh Bergen, our, our digital editor, is responsible for putting it, you know, on the dot com. And I'd say about half the time, it's about the same story, just the digital version. Uh, and the other half, we are able to boost it with a lot of additional photography that, uh, you know, we weren't able to use in the magazine uh, and a lot of digital resources and, and video in particular. Uh, usually one article or two articles uh, an issue we have like a companion video like every time we do a a fly tires bench in in the magazine for instance there's a corresponding video that goes with it for our youtube channel and for uh, the dot com so people don't just get to read about charlie craven tying a new fly they can you know get the video content that goes with it and we do similar stuff um uh, we just had one on uh, George Daniel wrote a story about Euro jigging. Uh, and we had a whole companion video to go along with that. So when the story appears in the magazine, we refer people to the video. And then when the story goes to the website, the video is actually embedded right into the story. So it's all together. Yeah, that's perfect. So we're trying to do more and more video content, especially on instructional stuff. Because we, you know, kind of feel like that's our wheelhouse. This episode is sponsored by Stonefly Nets. Stonefly Nets is putting quality before quantity with their handcrafted custom wood landing nets. Ethan Eigelhart now lives in the trout-rich waters of Arkansas and handcrafts these sweet wooden landing nets that you've got to check out. 
I've been using my net and had that thing tucked next to me for quite a while now. And actually, we just uh, got back from the Skachin trip and uh, had uh, Ethan supported that that cool trip by giving away one of his nets. And this thing uh, was pretty amazing. Broke it out. He gave it a little sweet uh, uh, Canadian touch because that's, that's where it was headed. Ethan keeps a small stock of nets on his website, but builds a lot of these custom nets to order. You can select from the right size, different wood options, handle, and hoops. For Ethan, creating a custom wood net is all about tradition and family, and it reminds him of that story that we've told before here and that first bamboo rod that he had from his grandmother. So I hope you have a chance to support this great company and a podcast. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly right now. That's S-T-O-N-E-F-L-Y. Okay, back to the show. Good. I was just looking at some of the articles, and I'm not sure if these are, you know, the top articles. But I, mean, I guess when you think, you probably have no idea. I'm not, I'm not even sure how many posts. Is, is that whole website, you know, you have a dedicated person for it. Do you, I mean, how much of a connection do you have? Do you kind of know what's hot on the, the blog itself, or is that just a separate entity kind of running? I mean, you're the editor, obviously, but is there a lot of connection there? Um, yeah. Uh, the guy that runs the website, um you know, we talk all the time and I guess I'm in charge of it, but I don't do the day to day. But, you know, we talk every couple of days and I point out uh, stories that we need to cover, important issues that I think will be hot. I'm not always right. And then uh, I get monthly reports at the end of the month saying, you know, this is where all the traffic went. So sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm wrong. But I do try to guide things and try to make sure, you know, I think actually... I'm probably a detriment because I'm the guy who's always like, people should be paying attention to this. But yeah. unfortunately, that's not always what they pay attention no. to. But I'm trying. Yeah, no, it is. It's, it's just like the conservation stuff, right? That's always the part of the struggle is that sometimes those don't get quite the traction of, say, a, you know, whatever top 10 boats or, or drift boats or something like that, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or how to tie the Pertagon or anything that's sort of controversial gets a lot of traction. Exactly. I'm glad you said the Pertigo because I was looking at some of these, and I'm not sure if these are your top uh, posts, but these were they got a lot of traffic on the website. And kind of some of these, a few of these were like the no, nine best knots, top drift boats, four best small rafts, 15 um, you know, top carp flies. The Paragon Nymph was a big article. Um, there was one on like 12 steelhead flies, um, one on muskie as well. And we recently did a muskie episode and um, so those are some, you know, I mean, there's a wide range of things. So it's not like you guys are just hundred, like 80% kind of trout fishing, right? You guys are mixing up pretty good on the, on the website and in the magazine. Yeah, that's been a conscious choice. I mean, that's always the battle too, because trout sells magazines and, you know, I'm in, I'm in the business of selling things, but at the same time, we've made a conscious effort to try to highlight other species, you know, there's Climate change has been a problem, and all the the hoot owl how hours and overcrowding on the Madison and warm water and you know people. I'm hearing from so many people complaining about how crowded it is on the South Platte in Colorado, how crowded it is on the Yellow Breaches in Pennsylvania, how crowded it is on the Madison. And the easy response is, well, don't go there. Yeah, <laughs> go someplace. Uh, and yeah. and that's what we been trying to encourage people to do so we've done you know intentionally done stories on other species like big stories on uh, like Blaine Chocolate did a cover story for us recently on fishing for snakeheads and other species like alligator gar and carp's an obvious one and uh, dang he even caught you know even talked did a little thing in that story on fly fishing for paddlefish and you know, a lot of weird species and, you know, we're really trying to do a lot of smallmouth bass and uh, that's why we did the musky story. So, you know, people need to branch out and, you know, it, it's good for business if people are, are trying these other species too, because a lot, you know, you go musky fishing, you're, you know, your five weight trout rod's not going to do it. So you need different gear. You're going to be fishing in a different place for different species and, you know, I'm all about spreading people out, but it's a it's a very complicated issue that I'm, you know, 25 years later, I'm still trying to unravel it. 
like just you know, while we're on this topic. So, you know, one of the big pushes is, is us trying to cover other species so people will get off of these crowded waterways. Uh, another thing we consciously do is try to talk about, you know, sort of the lesser known, smaller places. But I mean, that's a double edged sword. Yeah. You know, we're trying to relieve in if you look at the Montana example, we're trying to relieve all that pressure that's happening on the Missouri and the Madison. So we recently did a story on like five or six lesser known streams in in central Montana, like the uh, Muscle Shell and, uh, you know, those rivers in there, mm -hmm. Belt Creek. And of, and of course, you know, that makes people upset because yep. they think that, you know, Bell Creek's their little river and we, we shouldn't be writing about that. So it's a conundrum. Yeah. Do we always write about the crowded places and keep people going there? Or do we write about the lesser known places? Uh, and I think the only uh, ethical answer is just do a balance of all of them. Exactly. Yeah, no, I, it's a. Uh... That's always the thing. I'm kind of in the same boat, you know, with these podcast episodes, we, you know, sometimes focus and I try to always think kind of diversity, right? I think diversifying things, even though we know, yeah, like you said, lots of trout fishermen, but I think, and, and that goes with both, you know, even on demographics, right? I mean, we want to bring more diversity and more women into the sport and all that. So I think, um, I think diversity is good, right? Is that, is that kind of how you, do you see when you look at the magazine now versus say, you know, when John Randolph first talked to you, um, do you see a lot of differences on that, just the diverse topics and everything? I, I don't even remember back in like 96, were there people going to, you know what I mean, like paddlefish and all this stuff back then? No. No. We've done a lot more of that, but I, I mean, John Randolph got Dave Whitlock to do basically the first printed story on fly fishing for carp. So it was happening, you know. Uh, and, and Dave at the time was really pushing panfish and bass and stuff like that. He was a great advocate, is a great advocate for warm water species. So they were all always doing that, but not sort of the crazy stuff like snakeheads and stuff like that, that we're, we're getting into now. Yeah, that's right. Are some of the articles, I'm not sure that one obviously is a while ago, but when you publish it sounds like you published some of the articles that were in the magazine on the website, the ones that don't get on the website. I mean, are those article, can you get that information, say a, a random episode, uh, thing on carp, something like that from the magazine? Uh, all of the feature content that uh, goes in the magazine, like all of the big stories that from a hundred percent of that goes on the website. The only thing that we sort of miss, you know, that we don't put on the website is a lot of times like news stories that have a timely element and that, you know, they're not going to be relevant six months from now. So there's really no point putting them on the web. Mm. So it's, it's a lot of just like uh, a couple of the department and the, the news and new products and stuff like that. That's only in the magazine and you know doesn't make it to the website. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I guess you can't put everything. I'm just thinking like you got some, cool random topic on like you said carp dave whitlock and carp or something something like that you know it'd be fun to be able to track that down but essentially yeah that's why you got to subscribe to the magazine right if you want to get everything that you get the magazine right. on the website can't give a hundred percent of it away for free that's right uh so so i, re I recently ran into uh, oliver white uh at iftd it was really great to connect with him we had him on a long time ago and we talked about kind of indie fly and some of the cool stuff. And he's making a big transition kind of back to the uh, like Idaho area. Um, but I know he's done some work, right? He's been a column. I'm not sure if he's a columnist now or whatever, but who are some of those people like Oliver White that have like, do you have regular folks that are kind of your go-to that are writing kind of every issue? Uh, we do. Uh, and Oliver is, is a great one. Uh, he's been writing for the magazine for years and years. Uh, I think maybe uh, we got to know each other through Lefty, but hmm. we were like mutual friends and he used to hang out with Lefty a lot and he's written an enormous amount for the magazine and uh, uh, he took a little time off, but I saw him at IFTD too and he's ready to get back on the, the, the horse and start writing again. Oh, good. He just had, you know, he just had a little boy and bought a new business and he's been kind of swamped, but yep. you're going to, he, you know, he has done an enormous amount for fly fishermen and he's, uh, and you will see a lot from him in the near future. Um, Hillary Hutchison has probably been our top contributor the past 
two or three years. I mean, she's always got something in, uh, mm-hmm. in fly Fisherman magazine. I really admire her. She is such, she is such a pro. Uh, a lot of times when we get, uh, articles coming in from fishing guides and stuff, you know, maybe they're, uh, their manuscript might need a little fixing up, yep. but not Hillary. She is such a pleasure to work with. She is smart and capable, and I wish we could have her in every single issue. <laughs> that, that's my goal. That's cool. Uh, she's, been, she's been great for the magazine. Uh, George Daniel is another very, very frequent contributor. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you had him on the podcast? I have, yeah. George was awesome. He told the story of uh, – we had some fun. We had uh, – uh, he was talking about Joe Humphreys and some stories there. So yeah, George is amazing. Yeah. And he, he writes a lot, uh, you know, a lot of how to stuff, whereas Hillary and, uh, and Oliver write, you know, adventure stories. George is, man, that guy is a vacuum when it comes to trout. Yeah. He can, oh man, he just, it's, it's amazing to watch him and, uh, my goal is just to get all of that knowledge out of his head and get it into the magazine because that guy really knows how to catch fish. Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, he, he lives in Pennsylvania too, so we can get together and fish oh, nice. and he's always fun to hang out with. Uh, and, uh, Blaine chocolate is another one of our top contributors. Uh, he wrote the musky story. Um, I think that story got a lot of traction because of the, some of the fish pictures that he had in there. Mm. Uh, and we had a, we had a magazine cover in the fall of uh, a guy named Rob Smith who works at the fish hawk with just this monster uh, musky. And that was one of our best selling issues in the last few years and uh, created a lot of stir when it went online too. It's just really an incredible photo and an incredible story by Blaine. He never would tell me how many inches it was. Blaine's caught so many of these monster musky that he doesn't he doesn't bother to measure them anymore. <laughs> oh wow, I'll, either big or it's not big. <laughs> it's big enough. And I'll put a link to all these that that one with Blaine in the show notes as well, so we can take a look at that. Yeah, it's good. And then uh, in Colorado, Landon Mayer does uh, a lot of work for us out in the Rockies too. He's he's a yep. big contributor. I'd say those that's that's our handful of people that you know, are frequent and dependable and identifiable with Fly Fisherman magazine. Uh, when those people have a story idea, they, they check with me first to see if I want it. Yeah, it's a good mix there. It looks like you got a good coverage on different uh, kind of parts of the country and species. And um, and uh, and Oliver was kind of the international, right? He was kind of traveling. Now that he's kind of coming back, I'm not sure. Do you have, I, I guess you probably have lots of other people that could write articles and like you said, you're writing some of those kind of traveling around the world uh, sort of articles. But how does that look when you have somebody, you know, other people, new folks? Is there if somebody's listening now and they're they've they got knowledge, is there an opportunity for them to get in the door and maybe write write for you guys? Yeah, definitely. I just named some of our top contributors, but you know, collectively they would amount to thirty or forty percent of the content. Uh, you know, we really have to have a lot of diverse stories from all over the country and internationally. So, uh, every single issue I'm, I'm working with somebody brand new that I've never worked with before. So there's, there's always an opportunity to just email me at Ross at fly and pitch your story idea and why, you know, why it's interesting and why it should be in fly fisherman magazine. And we can talk. Perfect. All right. Good. Good. We'll leave that open. And then the international stuff, is that kind of just a, a small percentage of, of what you do? Like what, what is the just ran, you know, just roughly percentages U S versus or North America versus say international? Uh, usually about one story per issue. Uh, and uh, you know, during COVID we've intentionally tried to do a lot less because international travel has been mm-hmm. difficult and challenging, obviously. So we've done less than normal. Um, we also, we, we publish three um, annuals. One of them is called Destinations, and it's it's a beautiful book that's 120 pages square bound on just like luxurious paper. 
that has amazing photography and it's almost all international fly fishing travel and it oh, comes wow. out every year about uh labor day and it's on sale for 90 days so that magazine is nothing but international content and oh. and stuff like alaska and yeah. you know lodges in montana but i mean it's like places that people will you know jump on a plane and, and go to yeah so uh the, the last one we did hillary was on the cover with a permit and she had a permit story inside and we covered places like ascension bay belize costa rica uh, bahamas so there's a lot of saltwater content in that one too so we we always have a need for international and saltwater content uh, our two other uh, newsstands are uh, we do a gear guide every year that comes out just before Thanksgiving, and it is the only printed uh, gear guide in the fly fishing industry. We've done it for 12 or 14 years. Um, every other sport like golfing and skiing and bow hunting and everything, they all have a gear guide. Mm -hmm. uh, and fly fishing should have a gear guide too and yeah. that, that was my thinking in producing this so it's a full magazine that's just toys and rods <laughs> and real gadgets and new stuff that's coming down the pipeline mm -hmm. you know probably about half of it is stuff that's not even for sale yet i've just sort of got an inside track on new stuff that's coming out and you know you might see this next spring type stuff gotcha but uh that does really well and then every year we've got uh, uh an annual called fly fishing made easy and it's targeted just at beginners uh it doesn't get mailed to our subscriber it's out there on newsstands in barnes and noble and walmart and you know kroger grocery yep. stores stuff like that and the whole idea is to just recruit new people into fly fishing and let them know how easy it can be to get started and let them know the gear they need to get started uh my idea with recruiting these new fly fishers is that, you know, every time we get a new person to pick up a fly rod, that's a potential conservationist and a mm -hmm. potential person that can be on our side. Uh, and the, you know, old people are getting on in years and can't run all these trout unlimited clubs and stuff like that yeah. forever. It always needs to be new blood coming in. And I think that's part of our responsibility is to bring new blood in. Mm -hmm. So, those are what our annuals are all about. Yeah, and the annuals are just, it's just an annual one time a year, one issue part of the Fly Fisherman magazine. Yep. Yeah. I mean, they're separate. They're separate books, and they're only on newsstand only. So if yep. you're a subscriber, you don't get that in the mail. You have to go, you have to go and buy it. Yep. Perfect. No, I love the Fly Fishing Made Easy. That's, that's a super awesome idea because that's, uh, you know. An important piece, you know, and it's always a struggle because as you get into the content, you know, even with like this podcast, you know, we keep, you know, getting diversifying and doing more and more topics, but there's always new people out there that, you know, how do you make sure when a new person comes in, you're not talking about the most, you know, extreme high level fishing that they might not ever do, right? How do you keep them connected? And it sounds like you guys have a good path there. Yeah, and it's, it, I just thought it was important to bring up because, you know, there's, there's a universe of content and, you know, people might think, well, Fly Fisherman magazine doesn't do a lot of saltwater stuff, but we do have a magazine for that, you know, and if you're a gear hound, we have, we have a magazine for that. And if you're just getting started, we have a magazine for that too. Uh, whereas Fly Fisherman is sort of targeted at expert level fly fishermen, uh, you know, who want to know mostly about where to go locally or maybe in the next state and, so we, we like to think we got something for everybody. Yeah, I love that. How do you decide, you know, as you look out now, you're, you've got all this good stuff going, you know, the next thing you're going to be working on as far as like a project or, uh, you know, changing or adding something new? Is that something you're always kind of trying to, you know, you're kind of designing it, right? It, it seems like a, a challenge. How do you make, you know, your next thing even bigger than what you've been doing? Hmm. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a next best, next yeah. big thing. I have an idea for another magazine project that I want to get started, but it kind of uh, got a got it kind of got put on the back burner because of COVID. Oh right. I think there's an opportunity for it. Yeah. 
it seems like, I mean, that is the challenge, right? Because you are the, I mean, you're the main person, like you said, you're the publisher, you're doing it all now. So the, the buck kind of stops with you. It seems like these ideas, I mean, for some people, even like me, you know, the ideas can be challenging at times. I mean, how do you come up with, you know, the idea that's part of the, you know, the design, the, the bigger picture, right? The visionary stuff. That, is that a challenge for you? Is that something that, you know, just you feel like you, you can, uh, you're pretty good at that? Uh, I guess I'm pretty good at it, but I'm also observant. I I think that's one of my good qualities as a fly fisherman. I mean, any good fly fisherman is observant, like Mm -hmm. you see what's going on and you react and change to to what's happening on the water. And uh, I think you can make an equivalency there in the the magazine business and with fly fishing. There's there's changes in the sport of fly fishing that uh, we could better reflect in the magazine, I think. Yeah. Well, I, you know, like I said, it's a, uh, it's not an easy thing, but I think you've been doing a good job and the, you know, the artist thing, you know, I guess maybe that's part of it, having the right staff, you know, you mentioned that your art director or whatever. I mean, yeah, your, your magazine definitely like just, you know, it sticks out because you see it and from the cover and all the way through. Uh, and I'm sure you attribute that to your, your art person there, right. Developing some. Yeah. 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 He's amazing. And, uh, I've had other art directors in the past that weren't really into the fly fishing thing, Mm. but uh, Dennis is an amazing fly fisherman. Like he is super into it. So I I think anytime you uh, tackle your job with passion, you're going to get better results. And he's really passionate about it. This episode is sponsored by Fairflies, founded with the idea of finding ethical solutions to fly tying materials and products. They've done just that by creating jobs for marginalized groups in the U.S. and abroad. They are experts and innovators, artisans of exceptional fishing products. Jeff and I connected a while back at a local show, and it's really been cool to see the progress of Fairflies and all the great stuff they have going. And now we're going to have some more things as this uh, as this year rolls along. 5D brushes make fly tying fast enjoyable for all skill levels. Fairflies has replaced craft fur with their own fly fur product made by fly tires for fly tires they now own and run wasatch custom angling tools and are carrying on that tradition of making handcrafted heirloom quality fly tying tools you can head over to wetflyswing.com slash fairflies right now that's f-a-i-r-f-l-i-e-s and you can support this podcast in a really great company and get some quality tools at the same time okay back to the show um, so what are, you know, some of the, again, we were talking about topics. I mentioned like six or seven of these things that are pretty popular, at least currently. But what are some of your favorite topics maybe that you don't cover as much as you'd like? Or is there anything that comes to your mind, you know, when you say, hey, these are things I'd like to do more of, but just maybe because of the demographics you're not doing right now? Things I'd like to do more of. Or do you, are you, do you just uh, like everything out there? Do you, when you get something, you're like, Hey, I want to go for, you know, like you said, some jungle fishing. I think I heard you on Tom Rosenbauer, right? You, it's like, okay, I want to talk about jungle fishing. You just, you just make it happen. Yeah. But I was inspired by people that knew how to do the jungle fishing by Rodrigo and Marcelo and yeah. uh, uh, Mike Michalak at, at the fly shop. I remember him telling me like eight years ago, He's like, the jungle is the next best thing. You know, it's, it's <laughs> unexplored. There's tons of rivers down there that don't have lodges on it. And, and pe- you know, people don't really have a clue on on the quality of the fishing down there. And and uh, I think he was, you know, one of the visionaries there. Uh, and it's and it's really blossomed. Mm-hmm. Now, there's a, a, a lot of fishing going on in the jungle. And I think there's an, a lot of opportunities to do more. Uh, when I was talking to Rosenbauer, I had just got back from making a film called Blood Run, where I think the film had just come out. Uh, and that, that is a 90-minute uh, documentary that's on our YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a story in the ma- companion story in the magazine, too. Uh, we, we went down and fished the, the Rio Jingu, uh, and it's in the Kayapo Native Territories. Um, and the fishing element of it that, you know, we wanted to catch wolf fish and peacock bass and payara, uh, the environmental side of it was, 
I don't know if you remember a few years ago when Brazil was burning and there was yeah. all these fires. Yeah. Like they were in and at the boundaries of the indigenous territory. And basically, uh, these indigenous people, the Kaipos, are, are fighting for their land. They've got people coming in and illegally logging or illegally mining in the river, uh, you know, with no enforcement or oversight from their federal government. So they're kind of, it's kind of like the Wild West, and they're trying to keep these people out from abusing their territory, and they're trying to find ways to, to build an economy. And, and one of the obvious ways of building an economy is having, uh, having tourist fishermen come in there and uh, do catch and release fishing. And you know, there's obvious environmental advantages to this, uh, like, for instance, on the Rio Jingu, uh, Rodrigo was dealing with the natives there. Uh, they invited him to come and sample the fishing uh, years ago, and he said, you know, the, this river is basically fished out. What you really need to do is start patrolling the river. Don't let poachers come in from downstream. Uh, release all of these kinds of fish, you know, peacock bass and payara, and I'll come back in a few years. So they started like taking care of the river, stopping poachers from coming in there. The fish population came back. Next thing you know, uh, Rodrigo can build a lodge there. Wow. Just because of, you know, that he, he's made the tribes aware of, you know, the, the potential revenue and the potential opportunity of protecting those fish and then having catch and release fishermen come in. So when I went down there and made the film with Rodrigo, uh, there was no lodge or anything. We were sort of like the, the first ones to fly fish it. And uh, we made a film with the, with the idea that hopefully that would help save their land and save their forest. Because uh, that's tied to the waterway. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. These rivers are big, clear rivers. And uh, you log the watershed. You've just got another muddy river, yep. just like we've seen here. Right. You need the creek, especially when you get rain like that. That's right. Yeah, you need the forest. The forests are yeah anywhere. You can't you can't just clear cut everything and expect the streams are going to stay healthy. That's uh, that's kind of crazy. Uh, it sounds like you know this is and I know you, we mentioned Oliver his Indie Fly thing. You know his program, the nonprofit he has. Sounds like similar deal, right? They go into local communities and then kind of help uh, the local indigenous people guide and be right take care. Is that was that connected to this or was that kind of a separate thing? Um. It's a separate thing. I mean, Indie Fly uh, is a fantastic program. Um, I was introduced to it by Oliver. We went uh, years ago. We went in. Oliver and I went into Guyana and saw that the Indie Fly project that they had set up there. And Oliver did a story in the magazine. And when I just talked to Oliver at IFTD, he said that. That whole program now is just up and running by itself, and they wow. have taken control of it. But the Amazing. difference with IndieFly, and this is, this is the main difference, IndieFly is a nonprofit organization, and their goal is to turn the entire operation over to the to the locals, yeah, to the to the indigenous people, so that they will have complete ownership and run it. Uh, there's a lot of other programs that I've written about and promoted and been involved with uh, down in the jungle where they, you know, it's more of a partnership. You work mm -hmm. with the locals and make sure that the locals benefit, but you're the one that's doing, you know, all of the marketing in the United States. And, you, you know, you're the one that's running the outfitting business. Uh, and there's, you know, several people that have, have, have done well using that model. Maybe untamed angling is the best one because they've got you know got places in Bolivia and Brazil, uh, and you know th they work with the native tribes in a 50-50 partnership to make sure that all the all the natives benefit. But you know, in, when it comes to the marketing side of things in those remote areas, they're you know the indigenous tribes obviously have a disadvantage and. Yeah, have a tough time succeeding. So that's a kind of a problem. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think both ways work. And I mean, they're not confrontational at all. I think they, they go hand in hand. Uh, I'm a big fan of IndieFly. What they did in Guyana was uh, an amazing model. And now what they've got going on is a little closer to home, trying, you know, working on the Wind River 
uh, reservation, trying to get more employment there by, you know, getting some native guides and maybe getting a lodge in the Wind River. Uh, that I think that's going to be a story in Fly Fisherman in in the very near future. There, you know, Oliver's written about it before, mentioned it in some of his other stories, but they are right on the cusp of making something big happen there in the winds, which makes a lot of sense because the Wind River, I, I, I fished it years ago. I used to, you know, go up there from Fort Collins and you'd pay 20 bucks, get your uh, reservation permit, go yep. fishing for big giant brown trout. It's amazing. But, and then you just leave, but the, the people on the reservation don't get anything out of that, you know, nothing. So, you know, the Indie Fly project, as I understand it, is trying to get them, you know, give them an opportunity to get uh, native guides that can, you know, create an employment scenario and build a lodge where people can stay and spend their money and, you know, create employment there. Because the, uh, the unemployment situation on the reservation is terrible. And this, you know, this this goes back hundreds of years to, you know, the treaty rights and stuff. And, you know, this is their hunting and fishing lands. So it doesn't make sense that we can just like go in there and go fishing and they they don't profit from it. You know, back 200 years ago, you go to war over stuff like that. Right. Uh, that doesn't happen now. But I mean, it, if this is their land and they're protecting it they should be able to benefit from it. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I think uh, IndieFly is doing a great job in educating the public, you know, the angling public that this could and should happen. But they're also working, you know, you, you have to have the people, the indigenous people who believe in it and will support it and work to make it happen too because this stuff That's know, right. takes years to develop and takes a lot of training. You don't, I'm not a fishing guide instantly, you know. No, I love it. I, I love that you mentioned that. I, I think the uh, that's what Oliver and I was talking to his uh, executive director there on Indie Fly, and it's uh, for me it's pretty powerful because yeah, I kind of have a little bit of a connection. I would love to help. Um, I'll put a sh in the show notes Superman. I love to give a shout out to Superman. He's a a uh, indigenous uh, hip hop artist, really cool guy who's trying to promote you know kind of good medicine is what he calls it. You know, good medicine and. And he's out in, in Montana, and um, but I think this is a great opportunity because he's saying the same message, right? How do we help, you know, these people kind of get up and, you know what I mean, and, and get off of, you know, the struggles that they're having. So I'm excited because I think I'm going to hopefully connect and do a show with uh, with them on that and, and maybe even make a, a trip out there. So this is, this is the good stuff. I was going to ask you at the start, you know, kind of that nonprofit or conservation or organization that we could highlight. And I think this is probably maybe a good one just talking about, you know, there's indigenous folks all around the U.S., right? And you might not even know it. But um, um, so this is good. Well, it's been a big passion of mine when when I travel, like one of the places I like to choose is where you can have a lot of interaction with the the locals and like see their culture and experience their culture and get them involved in the fishing. Yeah, that's it. Well, we're going to, we're going to take it out of here uh, pretty quick here. I just wanted to touch, I was kind of hitting on this earlier, just thinking about, you know, some of the, the topics, you know, maybe your favorite topics or things you have coming. Um, but can you give us a, a heads up? I guess the magazine itself, talk about that quickly. H how many issues are coming out? W what's the next one? And then talk about what you have coming, maybe a highlight in the next uh, kind of year. Fly Fisherman magazine comes out five times a year and uh, three are already done from from my standpoint. So we have two more coming this year. Um, I guess big stories to look forward to that I'm really excited. Uh, number one is the Klamath. And this is I think this is going to be our biggest story in our fall issue. Uh I'm excited about it because the Klamath dams, like I've been reporting on this for 20 years and I can't tell you how many times I, we have reported that the dams are definitely coming down and then it turned out to be, you know, wrong because yep. there's too much red tape and too yep. much politics and too much bureaucracy. But now I'm going to say it again, Klamath dams are coming down this time for real. And I'm super excited about it because the Klamath, you know, as it stands right now, best steelhead system in California. Hmm. 
It has a healthy population, like a genetic pool of steelhead in there, like a viable population. And when those dams come down and those existing fish can start accessing all of the headwaters and using that spawning and rearing area, I, I think it's just an incredible opportunity. And, you know, that's what gets me excited is about new opportunities for, for fly fishing. We've, we've done the dam removal story before uh, many times. I mean, we covered the, the Kennebec was really the first big dam removal that we, we covered. Uh, problem is there's more dams up above that yep. one. Yeah, um, we covered the Elwa mm-hmm. River, the Elwa Dam removal, yeah, was huge. which was a big dam. But I mean, they were starting with nothing basically. You know, everything was wiped out, and it's been interesting to see how like resident rainbows upstream have decided to go to sea and stuff. And you know that that has been a great story. But uh, my imagination really gets running when I imagine what could happen on the Klamath when there's already a viable, you know, a big viable population of healthy steelhead and they can just like move into that habitat and start spawning. I, I think the potential there is huge. Yeah. Super excited about that. Perfect. So, and then give, give, could you give us a highlight to some other stuff you have coming just to, uh, you know, uh, I'm not sure what other articles you have coming in the magazine or on online. Yeah, that'll be in the fall issue. The The magazine that I'm working on right now is, is the August-September issue. It comes out uh, around the 4th of July. We are going to have a great story in that one on the, on the Deerfield River. Um, when I choose to do stories, there usually has to be like a news element, like something has to be new. Uh, you know, Fly Fisherman's written about the Deerfield River before and the Klamath River before. But so what's new? Uh, on the Deerfield, there was, there's been the last few years, there's been a massive FERC relicensing program. Yep. So, you know, there's the negotiations have been endless for years. They've been trying to get, uh, you know, relicense this thing and they finally signed a deal, which is going to benefit the trout and benefit the fly fishermen, uh, over the last I don't know how long the last license was, but they ran it for the benefit of whitewater rafters. This is like a general review, but they would have these blasting high flows on the weekend so people could go do whitewater rafting. And then in the, during Monday to Friday, you got a trickle. Well, we all know that that's not good for trout populations, but the, you know, every, these dams every 20 years or so, they have to get relicensed and uh, the dam in the deer field, has a new license that's going to provide much better flows for fly fishermen. So, you know, for, for guys that live out in the East and fish on that river, things are, things are about to get better there. Mm. Yeah. Where's like the deer field? New opportunities. Yeah. What, what state is that in? Mass. Okay. So those are a couple of good conservation. What about some of your other uh, contributors? Any, anything else like kind of some of the uh, locations, destinations, tips and tricks, anything else you want to highlight? Uh, George has got a story coming out, uh, on, uh, controlling your loop. It's really kind of a master class on oh, like nice. how to make your loop real tiny and cast under bridges and under branches and get in those like little tight Sweet. places, uh, where big brown trout like to hide. And then he also does the opposite thing and, you know, shows how to make a real wide open loop with, uh, strike indicators and split shot and all mm-hmm. that stuff. Uh, nice. We've got this, an amazing series of illustrations by Joe Mahler in the magazine. And then we have a, a companion video that was shot by Jay Nichols that will, you know, detail in slow motion how George controls and modifies his loops in these different situations. And that'll be like that companion video on the website and, and YouTube. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, you, you've always got uh, – and you said five issues. So if um... – Say mid May, this is probably going to be live and kind of around the go drop. You know, mid May. What's going to be? What's out there that that time? Which which uh, issue is that going to be? Uh, in early May, uh, the June July issue will be coming out, and I'm I'm pretty psyched about that. I just just finished it today. Uh, it's the biggest fly fisherman magazine we've we've published in ten or fifteen years. I mean, it's a big fat book. 
uh, and it has some really cool stories. Uh, one of them is sort of a 10 page mega story from me on site fishing for trout. Hmm. Uh, and it really gets into the hardcore parts of like the color spectrum, uh, lens tints, uh, different frames, how they shield your eyes. And, uh, you know, most of it is like tips and tricks that I've learned from like guides in New Zealand and stuff on how to get into the best possible position to see fish and how to use your peripheral vision instead of your foveal vision Hmm. to spot fish. Um, A lot of people don't even know what foveal and peripheral (laughs) difference is, but it's pretty important when you're, you're scanning for trout and trying to uh, beat their camouflage, which is pretty excellent camouflage. Yeah. If you want to learn about sight fishing for trout, we've got that one. And we've also got uh, this contributor in England wrote this really amazing story called What Trout See. And it's kind of the opposite. Like my story is about looking for trout. His story is about what trout see from their point of view and what their vision's like. And he actually goes into the foveal vision of a trout and what they can see at distances and what they can see at three, six, and 12 inches. And there's a lot of insights in there. It sort of breaks down the problem of like when a trout sees your fly, it comes up to it. And then when it gets within three inches, it refuses. That's because... the three inch range is when they see the best. Mm. So basically what what's happening is they see something that catches their eye that might be food, but when they get up close, they see that it isn't food. And it's very interesting. Their, mm. the, their vision is not very good. So it's kind of funny because we put so much effort into flies sometimes that I think is pretty much useless because, you know, when they're three or four feet away from a, from a fly they don't see it like we do no that's that's a good tip it's a yeah it doesn't it's not that critical literally you could just put on size and and uh coloration all that is probably much more important than getting specific uh so this is good so you got some good stuff coming out here and you mentioned like the site Um, i'm kind of interested in you know the glass this is kind of goes back to the gear stuff and uh you know when you get into this you know you're talking about sight fishing obviously having the right pair of glasses how do you balance that with kind of the companies out there because i you know we were talking to costa at the show and they're obviously have some great stuff going but there's tons of people that have you know glasses how do you guys you know when you say hey we're gonna kind of on the gear guide stuff like we're, we're gonna use you know get a pair of glasses for sight fishing is that something that you struggle with a little bit or is that not something you really have to worry about that much like kind of promoting one, you know, uh, company versus the other sort of thing? Uh, We try to be balanced and fair and, and, uh, you know, pick out, you know, what are the good qualities of different, you know, whether it's a reel or a rod or Mm -hmm. or sunglasses. But, uh, you know, we also have favorites. (laughs) Yeah. Everybody does, whether it comes to, to, you know, rods or reels or sunglasses Uh, and you know, I don't have perfect vision and everybody sees differently. And, you know, over the years, um, Costa's been my go-to, uh, and, and it's not just a performance thing. You know, they've, this is a brand that really works hard at, uh, preserving the environment and they, they put a lot into, uh, our sport and into our industry. So, uh, I, that's a, that's a company that I can really get behind. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, one of the big lessons in that story on sight fishing is that people really need to use low light lenses more. Like I just don't see many people using them and they're really a huge advantage and both Smith and Costa have them. And, you know, you know, I, I pointed out the, the Smith, uh, sunrise silver mirror lenses and the the costa uh no the smith igniters uh and the light transmission rates you know the costa lets 25 percent through and um it has a 25 percent vlt and the smiths have a 40 percent vlt so we get really into the techie stuff but really one of the big lessons of that story is that you, you need a low light lens that you can use like a half an hour before dark or when it's super cloudy and you've yeah. got a dark bottom. People, a lot of people just use sunglasses that are too dark. 
Yeah, no, I know. I, I've always loved the yellow, you know, just the real, the yellow lenses, which I'm not sure if those are still yeah, the best. But yeah, they are both. Yeah, the the yellow lenses. Those are the low light lenses. Whether it's a Smith or a, a Costa, yeah. yellow is key. You yeah. got to let more light in. Exactly. Yeah, yellow's huge. And and out here, I'm in on the the west coast. You know, we get plenty of rain. So yeah, you got to definitely have something that you can see when it's dark out. Um, no, that's a good point. And like you said, the coast obviously has great stuff. And we had an episode we did with Costa, and we talked about kind of. It was more like choosing glasses actually took a little bit of flack from some people, or I think it was at least one person that was like, wow, you know, episode just on choosing glasses, maybe, you know, not the best, but, um, you know, I'm curious on that just quickly. We're going to, we're going to get out here pretty quick, Ross, but how do you, I'm sure you have this huge website, this huge magazine. How do you deal with some of the, um, you know, maybe some of the negative or the, the feedback you get, or even the trolls, like how, how do you guys, is that something, and this maybe is thinking about some other company who's listening now where, because that's hard, you get a, maybe a negative comment or somebody's just a troll. Um, what, what do you, is that something you even worry about? No, uh, with, I just ignore trolls. I don't get into it, but I do, you know, people who send me emails that have like a, they're polite about it and they have a complaint, a lot of times I'll get into a dialogue with them. Like, I don't mind at all. I love that. But you get to the point of a troll and you're just being ignorant and rude yeah. and or hiding behind a fake name or whatever. That's, that's not worth my time. Yeah. Uh, busy, but I'm always willing to have a dialogue on, on things that people might not disagree with or have a beef with. Mm -hmm. Actually, that turns into something great. I love talking to readers. Exactly. So Ross, well, I think we're going to, we're going to roll out of here. Any other, um, before we get out, you know, I guess you mentioned cause some of your upcoming magazines, um, anything you want to leave us with before we take it out of here? No, that's great. I had a great time talking to you. Awesome. Thanks for jumping into the Indie Fly. That's a great organization and, uh, any support we can throw them much appreciate it. I'm behind them. Awesome. Well, we'll keep an eye out. We're going to have a podcast, probably at least one or two coming up here in the near future. So, uh, if we can put it together and we'll send everybody out to uh, flyfisherman.com or uh, this newsstands to uh, subscribe. If somebody wants to subscribe, are they just pretty easy? Just go to your website and subscribe. Best place. Yeah. Up in the top right corner, there's a link that says subscribe and easy breezy. Get it sent to your house. That's it. All right, Ross, thanks for your time today. And we'll look forward to keeping in touch with you. All right. Thanks a lot, Dave. So there you go. Wetflyswing.com slash 333. 333 if you want to get the links and, uh, and check out some cool uh, probably a couple of bonus videos there if you take a look listener shout out Barry and the crew up Cam Bloops. I want to give a shout out to Barry that was a great trip we did up at uh, Skachin Lodge and it was really cool hanging out with Barry and the gang um, so Barry hope you're listening and really good to connect with you if you want to connect with me and uh, and get a shout out here and also potentially put together a podcast episode, send me an email, dave at wetflyswing.com. One last highlight, our trivia night is going on still. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash trivia, enter your email and you'll be in a draw for a bunch of these uh, fly tying swag giveaways we're doing. Uh, really simple and easy way, just enter your email and we're drawing these things as we go. And I hope you have a good day, a good evening, or a good morning, wherever you are. I hope to see you online or maybe on the water. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.